In the early 1700s, life for the common people of England was hard. With few labor laws to protect them and little time to devote to anything but survival, the young and old live difficult and often joyless lives. The comfort and the soul strengthening of God's word were confined mostly to churches, elegant places the common people had little time to visit or the proper attire to enter. Their future looked dark. But God had a plan. While the poor languished in their misery, God was working in the life of a young and devout clergyman whose own spiritual darkness would be changed by the light of God's word. This passionate young man would bring the gospel to them in their dingy workplaces, the muddy fields and even the mines, and in doing so would change their lives and his own life forever. John Wesley was born on the 17th of June, 1703. He was born in Epworth in England, which is 23 miles northwest of Lincoln. He was the 15th child of his parents, Samuel and Susanna Wesley. His father was an Oxford graduate and rector in the Church of England. Samuel and Susanna Wesley moved here in 1695 when Samuel became the rector of the parish of Epworth. Um, they arrived with four children and then they had the rest of the family here in Epworth. Um, altogether they had 19 children but only 10 survived to adulthood so it was quite a tragic story really uh, as was the norm for the time. Um, their eldest child was Samuel, uh, named after his father. And then there were two other boys, John and Charles, the famous brothers, the Wesley brothers, um, and also the seven sisters, the seven Wesley sisters, who had a much more limited life, really, than their famous brothers. His mother, Susanna, raised her children with a loving yet firm discipline, designed, as she would write to him in later life, to instill in her children a regular method of living. His mother's methodical approach left a deep impression on John, one that as an adult he would recommend in many of his sermons. We're in the room that's been known as Susanna's kitchen. We think it was actually the back kitchen of, of several kitchen areas in the house. Um, and this is, this is this area where Susanna educated her children, which is one of the key things that happened here at the Epworth Old Rectory. Um, it, it was a letter she wrote in 1732 to John at his request outlining her method for educating her children. And he thought this was so important that he published it in his own journal and also in the Arminian magazine. So it was clearly a crucial time for his life. Um, and it was a very methodical, disciplined school, which is where we believe that word method came from. Um, they had strict hours for strict classes and she taught them um, almost every part of a school curriculum you could imagine. So even the girls were taught to read and write, which was unusual in those days, but because Susanna herself was an educated woman, she wanted her daughters to be able to be educated too. And it wasn't just her home school, but it was also the fact that she took a time, um, set aside a time all through the week, a different day for each of her children. Um, and that was um, a sort of focused time when she would listen to their concerns. It wasn't for her to impart information to them, but just to listen to them, to see what they were thinking about and, and how they were developing. She also wrote numerous letters um, to all of her children um, through their lives, advising them and helping them out with things. And, um, and John you know, would, would listen to his mother even when he wouldn't listen to anyone else. No doubt raising as many children as Susanna did made for a very busy household. Yet this busy mother made sure to spend an individual hour with each child weekly and managed to spend time alone herself in quiet prayer. How? The children knew that when mother sat on a chair with her apron covering her head, she was not to be disturbed. Mother was spending time with God. While Susanna Wesley was by all means a Bible-centered woman, she wasn't afraid to question her husband's authority. She was often at odds with Samuel over matters of politics or theology. Letters reveal a marriage-threatening quarrel over who was rightfully the King of England in 1701. 
she refused one evening to add Amen to the Book of Common Prayer for the King. Samuel and Susanna had quite a stormy relationship at times, obviously very loving, but also quite stormy. Um, and there were several times when Samuel took himself off to London. He was a member of Convocation, which gave him really a, a release valve from really what was quite a difficult life here in Epworth. Um, and on one of the occasions when he was away from home, um, Susanna felt that the curate that he'd left behind in the church was not really up to the mark um, and she felt she needed therefore to um, take care of the spiritual development of her family and the whole household and so she began to develop these Sunday evening prayers their family prayers became rather expanded um, until they were almost acts of worship which she should never have been leading and not least of not at all here in, in the rectory um, but it was reputed that in the end 200 people were on the ground floor of the rectory worshipping on a Sunday night, far more than were up at the church on a Sunday morning. The curate then wrote to Samuel and said, do you know what your wife is getting up to? She needs to stop. Um, and he wrote to her and told her to stop. Um, and she wrote back and said, you know, I'm an obedient wife. If you tell me, give you a frank command that I should stop this, then of course I will. But you're the one who then has to be responsible um, for all the state of these souls who are not saved when you answer before what she called the great and awful tribunal of our Lord Jesus Christ. A new monarch on the throne, Queen Anne, brought unity to the family household, only to be threatened by a life-altering event. John Wesley would write about an event that would remain with him for the rest of his life. He was six years old and had just fallen asleep. He woke up to a brightness all around him, wondering how morning had come so soon. He sat up only to see his room engulfed in flames. I saw streaks of fire on the top of my room. I got up and ran to the door, but could get no further, all the floor beyond it being ablaze. I then climbed up on a desk which stood near the window. And in the night, February night in 1709, the whole house was, was burning in the middle of the night and Mehetabel, Hetty, the middle daughter, found bits of the roof falling down on her bed and she raised the alarm. And they got all the family out. Susanna uh, Wesley, the mother of the Wesleys, was eight months pregnant with her last child, so it was quite hard for her to be rushing about. Um, and they did a head count, got everybody out, and realised that the five-year-old John was still in the house. Um, both the parents tried to rush back in and save him and were beaten back by the flames. Um, and so, even at the age of five and a half, he had the presence of mind to stand on a box at the window and call for help. The local people then made a human ladder. There was no time to fetch a ladder. Standing on the shoulder of a neighbour, John's father reached the boy just in time for him to jump into his arms. When John was saved from this fire, um, Susanna declared that this little boy had been saved for a special purpose and she coined this phrase that he was a brand plucked from the burning, saved at the last minute from, from the fire, a biblical quotation, um, because she felt he'd been saved by God for a special purpose. His mother's comment would leave a lasting impression on little John. And in years to come, he would diligently search for why and for what purpose God had spared his life. John Wesley was determined to be a man worth saving. Though they may not have always seen eye to eye, Samuel and Susanna Wesley instilled in all of their children a great respect for God and the sacred scriptures. From them, John learned the makings of a righteous man. John entered Charterhouse School in 1714 at the age of 10. Then in 1720, he went on to Christchurch College, Oxford. Now, it was the largest university in Oxford at the time, and immediately he fitted right in. Typical of a young man, he played sports, he played tennis, he played billiards, he went to dances, he went to plays, and he maintained several relationships with attractive young women. Then in 1726, when John was elected a fellow of Oxford's Lincoln College, he made a turnaround. He began to think of all the social activities that he was involved in, and although he enjoyed them, he began to wonder if it was really the best use of his time. After all, he never forgot that his life was spared for a reason, and he wanted to make sure that he was worthy of so great a favor. He later wrote in his journal, I executed a resolution which I was before convinced was of the utmost importance, shaking off at once all my trifling acquaintance. 
I began to see more and more the value of time. I applied myself closer to study. I watched more carefully against actual sins. We don't know that much about the six years that he spent at Charterhouse, um, whether he sort of rebelled against the strictness of his upbringing or, or not. It's very hard to tell. Some say that he did and some say he didn't. Um, but when he went to Oxford um, to enrol as an undergraduate there, he was already beginning to develop these very pious, earnest um, attitudes to, to, to faith and life. Um, and so it seems likely that at school he just carried on um, what he'd learnt here in the rectory. So that same year, his younger brother Charles also joined Christ Church College, Oxford. And like his brother, initially he was taken up with the amazing social scene. But it was John's influence that made him think more seriously about both his education and his religion. And John began to influence Charles. He began to share with him ways of living a more holy life, ways of praying, ways of thinking. And it was, it, it was these techniques, if you like, that later became characterized as Methodism. A man called John Gambold, who knew both the brothers at this time at the college, he described Charles as being deeply sensible of John's superiority over him. He said, the influence was so strong that should I describe one brother, I could describe both. It was at this time that John's father encouraged him to join the ministry. Charles soon gathered around himself a group of friends who would meet together regularly to pray and to read the Bible, and John joined them. Their fellow collegians called them the Holy Club. Now, this wasn't a term of respect, it was a term of mockery, because of their emphasis on strict observation for holy living. Well, the Holy Club was established by Charles Wesley, and it was essentially a response by Charles to the other members at Oxford University who Charles felt should be uh, much more spiritual in their outlook to life. But he was also of the view that they should be out engaging with the poor and the disenfranchised and a sense in which they needed to meet together to both uh, encourage each other uh, but also to organise themselves to go out and do these practical good works. John at the time was working with his father, the Reverend Samuel Wesley, at the adjoining parish of Epworth, uh, a place called Root. And it was only when John returned to Oxford as a fellow of Lincoln College that he then took over the leadership of the Holy Club as it became known. The Holy Club met together um, to, to pray together, they read their scriptures together, they studied together, um, particularly classics and languages and that sort of thing. Um, they also fasted and they had a regular sort of pattern of, of fasting. They observed the feasts of the church, they took communion um, at least once a week. Um, it was almost monastic in its um, approach to, to religious life, if you like. Um, but then they also went out and visited in the prisons. They took alms to, to people who, who were poor. Um, they set up a ragged school for, for young children um, and developed this loan system for local tradesmen who, who needed um, some help to get going so they could buy tools. Having followed his father's advice to become a clergyman, John was ordained a priest of the Church of England in 1728. In 1735, Great changes beset John and Charles. Their father died, and John set his eyes towards America and wanted his brother Charles to accompany him. When he consulted with his mother, she proudly replied, If I had twenty sons, I should rejoice if they were all so employed, though I should never see them more. The colony of Georgia was still a relatively new colony. It had only been established in the early 1730s. And so there was a sense in which there was a new world in which John could have an influence in the way in which not only the people in the colony conducted themselves, but also an engagement with the Native Americans. And I think this was something that greatly excited John, the prospect of being able to share his faith with these two different groups. John was certain that he had something to offer people in the new world. But it was precisely on his way to America to start his mission that he realized his inadequacy. On his journey to America, John Wesley uh, met a community of Moravian Christians on, on the, the boat um, and frequently worshipped with them, joined in with their, their worship and their studies together. 
Um, and at one occasion there was a, a huge storm on, on the journey, um, so much so that everyone was, was fearful for their lives. But he found this group of Moravians meeting together and calmly singing hymns in the midst of the storm. And afterwards he said to them, were you not afraid? You know, everyone else was. And they said, no, we're, we're not afraid to die, um, because they had this real peace and assurance. This experience brought John face to face with his own lack of faith. And he realized, even with his own meticulous observance and obedience to the word of God, something was still missing. The Moravians were a Protestant group founded in 1457 in Germany. And their principal message was one of salvation by grace for anyone who would choose to follow Christ. While John and Charles were both very taken by their example, John couldn't help but to compare himself with them and wonder why he lacked the assurance that even their children seemed to have. Once in America, the brothers were separated. John set to work in Savannah, Georgia, and Charles in Frederica. During his time there, John had the opportunity of continuing his contact with the Moravians via a man named Augustus Spangenberg. Spangenberg challenged John does the Holy Spirit of God bear witness in your heart that you are a child of God? Do you know that Jesus Christ is your Saviour? Well, yes, I know that Jesus is the Saviour of the world. And, uh, do you know that you are saved? Yes, I, I have always... Yes. No, no, no. Wesley, you, you hesitate. You must not hesitate. You must be certain. When the Holy Spirit of God is in your heart, your heart is filled with joy, and you know. A few moments later, Wesley tried to make his answer more convincing. But of that effort, he wrote in his journal, I fear they were vain words. John's continuing pursuit to discover what the Moravians had that he lacked did not deter him from pursuing the reasons he had gone to America, making Christian disciples of the colonists and evangelizing the Native Americans. Both, however, proved to be a greater task than he had imagined. Somewhat complicating things further, a uh, misunderstanding arose when John developed a friendship with a young lady called Sophie Hopke, who just happened to be the niece of a local magistrate. Sophie Hopke was the niece of the chief magistrate in, in Georgia at the time and, uh, and she and John Wesley became quite, quite close. She'd nursed him when he was ill with a fever and there was one occasion when they travelled together on a, on a stormy voyage between Savannah and Frederica, which aren't very far apart, um, but it had taken six days because of this storm. Um, and, and I think, you know, it got very close to him proposing to her, um, but she had declared that um, she'd already been asked by somebody else to marry them and uh, she'd said she didn't want to, but she had promised she would marry no one else if she didn't have this particular man and so John felt he couldn't ask her to marry him uh, and then within you know days he was suddenly asked as the clergyman to publish the bans of marriage between Sophie Hopke and yet another gentleman um, which astonished him and uh, she duly married this other man but then then she started neglecting the duties of religion and he um, you know he told her that she ought to come back and make sure that she was uh, living out her faith appropriately and eventually he, he banned her um, from communion, uh, much to the anger of both her new husband and her uncle, the chief magistrate, who then um, put, a, um, put up John before the court on a charge of defamation. Um, and he, it, the only way really for him to get over all this was to flee back to England, away from, from all this mess in America. It was a very unpleasant time for him. So when he arrived back in England, um, he felt a complete failure that everything had gone wrong and it was a very, a very low moment in his life. His experience in America had left John feeling completely overwhelmed and exhausted. His brother Charles had already left America due in no small part to illness. And although he did his best, his diary reveals just how defeated he felt. I went to America to convert the Indians, but oh, who shall convert me? Back in England, John sought out his brother Charles. They were close and he was concerned for his health and also for the things that had been troubling his mind. And no doubt he was also seeking out Charles 
for some comfort and for some counsel. I found my brother at Oxford, recovering from his pleurisy, and with him, Peter Bowler. Peter Bowler was himself a Moravian, and to John's surprise, Charles explains that through the witness of this man, he himself had experienced this peace with God. The same peace and assurance that they'd witnessed together on the stormy ship at sea. Now, instead of being overjoyed, John was perplexed. How could it be that he, as a faithful Christian, had not yet experienced this transformation that he'd seen in others? He later writes in his diary, I felt sorrowful and very heavy. John's journal records the vibrant conversation and correspondence that he had with Peter Bowler and reveals the critical role that Bowler played in helping John reassess the nature of his religious commitment and the meaning of his faith. One of the things that he did upon his return to England was to initially go over to Germany to try and understand more about the Moravians and the way in which they operated and conducted themselves and their beliefs. Um, and it was after his time in America when he, um, he, he came across Peter Bowler. He'd met him before, but Peter Bowler became, began to have quite an impact on his life. And, and in April 1738, Peter Bowler um, and John Wesley had a number of encounters. Um, and Peter Bowler realised that John Wesley was not, as he put it, a child of grace and felt that he, he could find something uh, much more real in his heart rather than this strict, rigid observance that was all about head stuff, if you like. How can I preach to others something I don't have myself? My brother, do not stop preaching. You preach faith until you have faith. Then you will preach faith because you have faith. And so it was like he, he was saying in the process he might find what he's looking for. And it was a very graceful, um, important friendship at that time for John Wesley. Although he was struggling internally, John continued with his preaching engagements. But the effect of this preaching was discouraging. Churches began to close their doors against him. John was hitting rock bottom and fast. He was desperate for God to intervene. On May the 24th, he records in his journal that at five in the morning, he opens his Bible and turns it to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. There are given to us exceeding great and precious promises by which we can be partakers of the divine nature. Later that day, he reads the verse, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And that very evening, unwillingly, he sets off to a meeting at a society established by Peter Bowler, a meeting where his prayers would be answered, a meeting that would change his entire life. This is very soon after they got back from America, so from a very, very low point in their lives, um, they came to this really high point. Um, and John Wesley wrote in his journal famously that he'd gone very unwillingly uh, to a society in Aldersgate Street, which was a sort of a Bible study type group, uh, where somebody was reading Luther's preface to the Romans. And, uh, and all through the day before that, he'd had all these little signs that had led him to think something important was coming. Um, and during this meeting that he was unwillingly attending, he, he said he felt his heart strangely warmed. Um, and this great assurance that even for him, the love and forgiveness of God was real, even for his sins and it, this was the moment really when all this you know this this learning this education all the stuff he'd got in his head suddenly was real in his heart and he, he felt this moment of grace from God that is why faith alone makes someone just and fulfills, and fulfills the law faith it is the faith it is the that brings the whole spirit of Christ the merits of Christ spirit renders the heart glad and free glad and free that is why faith alone fulfills the law John Wesley felt joyfully compelled to share the good news of salvation through grace with others. And the only way he knew how to do that was to preach from a pulpit. But unfortunately, the churches did not receive this message enthusiastically. In fact, they actually shut the doors against him. So praying for guidance, an answer came 
when he received a letter from George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield was an old friend of his from his Oxford Holy Club days. George Whitfield invited Wesley to join him preaching in the open air. Now, George Whitfield was a powerful and an eloquent preacher. He would bring crowds of people to their knees. He knew John Wesley needed some help. He knew he needed a pulpit, so he invited him. And John Wesley was appalled by the idea. I could scarce reconcile myself at first to this strange way of preaching in the fields. I should have thought the saving of souls almost a sin if it had not been done in a church. He arrived in Bristol in 1739 and he was here initially to witness George Whitfield preach in the open air. He records in his journal shortly after his arrival that uh, this strange way of preaching in the fields of which Mr Whitfield set me an example. And I think there's a sense in which John is not certain that this is what his calling is to be. And yet just within two days he then writes in his journal that he preaches in the open air for the very first time. And uses a phrase which uh, I think has always uh, uh, caused some... Um, debate, which is, he talks about, I submit to be more vile, to preach in the open air for the very first time. And I think that gives us, again, an example of how this was not something which perhaps came naturally to John, uh, and yet he felt that he had been called to do this. Perhaps out of a sense of desperation, John Wesley finally relented. And you can just imagine this meticulously dressed preacher maybe trudging up this this muddy path to his first open air meeting, not sure that he's doing the right thing and then against everything that he believes to be proper, John Wesley preaches. And he's astonished at the results. People respond. And the irony is, the very message that got him kicked out of the established churches is the very message that common people embrace. It was as if they were desperate for spiritual nourishment. Today, of course, we think of the rights that we have as individuals and citizens. And yet in the 18th century, there was no social welfare. There was no concern about you as an individual or a human being, uh, that uh, there was no issue about whether you were see, receiving good schooling or education or health care. In many circumstances, you were nothing more than fodder to be used and abused. Uh, and it's within that environment. And of course, the first place that Wesley preaches in the open air is the brick fields, aptly named. This, of course, is where bricks were made as more and more of the properties were built. And so it wasn't an open field with corn blowing in the wind. This was a dangerous environment. And I believe that Wesley would have regularly received taunts from others. Uh, that they almost would have been considered as sort of fair sports to be used and abused. And uh, therefore I believe it took great courage for Whitfield and John and Charles to go out and engage in this way. So field preaching, what was it like? What are we talking about? Um, let me tell you what it wasn't. It wasn't beautiful, green, rolling English countryside and it wasn't a kind of Jane Austen film. It was life and death. It was surviving every day. It was children working in mines. It was a type of almost animal survival. If people past 30, they were considered to be old. There was no hope, no future. People lived a desperate kind of life. And then this man comes along and stands in this dark world that you live in and and starts to preach that you're worth something, that there is a God and he loves you and you are of value. And people's response to it was, was desperate. They consumed it. It was, it was not a nice idea to consider. It was somebody throwing a drowning man a life belt. It was light penetrating the darkness. It was, here is the way out. This is the difference between life and death. It was in this dark, dangerous world that Wesley had come to preach. <laughs> 
Methodism grew largely because people were hearing the message of this inclusive love of God for all people and forgiveness for all people um, for the very first time. John Wesley was by now preaching out of doors, uh, wherever people would gather, in marketplaces, at mines, at farms, where ordinary people were, many of whom um, had not felt that religion, the church, had anything much to do with them at all. Um, the message they'd received was that they were not respectable enough, even if they'd thought about it. They couldn't afford the pew rents, so they couldn't dress in the right clothes, all that sort of thing. Um, and so this was a radical thing to be hearing, that this, this love and forgiveness of God was real for them. So John continued his field preaching, and eventually he was joined by his brother Charles. But almost immediately, he realised that further teaching is needed. Salvation by grace is not enough. People need to grow in their faith in Christ. And people have real immediate physical needs, and he's not prepared to just leave them in the situation that he finds them. Now, this is where John's methodical organisation really comes to the fore. His self-discipline, his upbringing, and now aligned with this new understanding of total dependency on Christ for the results, it all comes together. John Wesley begins to gather his converts into small groups. And so there was a huge reaction to John Wesley's preaching. It really was a, a massive revival. And uh, his great genius, though, was that he didn't leave people all churned up and excited by this message, um, but he then organised them. This is where the method of Methodism comes in. Um, organised them into small groups, into societies, and then smaller groups of classes, and then again into bands, which was an even smaller group, uh, where people could explore this faith, work out what it meant for their lives, um, change their lives as a result of it, because they could trust the people that they were the meeting with and, and talking with. Uh, and that was the great genius that John Wesley brought to it. As the number of believers grew, differences in social standing were issues that they had to face. John Wesley had a strong conviction that social pride could have no part in God's work. God's grace had been imparted to all, rich or poor, educated or unlearned. He admonished his preachers by writing, The lowest and the worst have a claim to our courtesy. This admonition echoes the words of Christ from the Gospel of Matthew. Whatever you do to the least of these my brethren, you do unto me. John and his followers didn't just preach the Gospel to their neighbours, they served their neighbours as well. And as a result, the movement grew. In response to the need, John established the new room the first Methodist building officially licensed for public worship. And the story is that on one occasion, so many people crowded into an upper room to listen to John that the floor collapsed and gave way. And as a result, John Wesley proclaimed to those present, we must build ourselves a new room. And so he purchased this piece of land just off the horse fair in Bristol and began to build the new room within six weeks of his arrival in the city. Uh, quite a, a remarkable turn of events to bring about a building in such a short period of time. So here we are, this is Wesley's first chapel, the new room. And it's a wonderful church, there's a, there's a tremendous sense of peace and of simplicity. And John was really enthusiastic about starting churches, but for practical reasons. See, the people he was preaching to, they had nowhere to go. He was preaching in fields. In the winter in England, it gets very cold. Those people literally needed somewhere to go. And this isn't just a church. At the time, it's also operating as a school. The place where he lived is on the next floor. That's where his room is. At the time, he awarded himself a stipend of 28 pounds annually. And to put that in context, in today's money, that's way below the poverty line. So we have the lower pulpit here, which we would be used for the reading of the Bible and leading of worship. Charles Wesley would have heard some of his hymns sung for the first time here at the New Room. The upper pulpit would be reserved exclusively for the preacher. John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and many associated with the establishment of the Methodist movement would have preached from that upper pulpit. 
What you'll also notice is the way in which it's very well protected. It was certainly not an easy existence to be a Methodist preacher in the mid to late 18th century. You were often verbally and physically abused. If you read Wesley's journal, you'll see on more than one occasion he fears for his life as he flees from a mob. And so this was to offer a degree of protection to the preachers. Again, as we look around the architecture of the new room, we notice that there are no windows on the ground floor. And again, this is because buildings in which the Methodist preachers spoke were often attacked. And so light instead comes in from the balcony section and from a lantern window above. It was not easy being a Methodist because many people were uncertain what the motivation was of the Wesleys and others involved with the movement. Uh, they were seen by some as directly attacking the Church of England. The irony being, of course, that John and Charles were Anglican ministers themselves. But again, in the same way as Wesley felt initially uncomfortable at the prospect of speaking and preaching in the open air, many of those within the Church of England still maintain that view that the saving of souls should always be done in a church, not in the open air. There were many who felt that by challenging the authority of the state church, you were by default challenging the authority of the state and of the king. And of course, we're not too far removed from the wars between the Protestants and the Catholics. Some thought that Wesley was even a Catholic sympathizer and that he was waiting for reinforcements to arrive from the continent to then overthrow the British monarch. So all sorts of wild rumors went around about what motivated Wesley and the other Methodists to do what they were doing. Uh, and as a result of which, they were viewed with great suspicion. John didn't stop field preaching and never really settled down. He was often seen traveling the country on horseback, reading books so as to make good use of his time as he made his way to his scheduled destinations. Charles eventually married, settled in Bristol, and continued to make use of his musical talents for God's glory. In the same way as John was very radical in his open-air preaching, Charles was equally radical in introducing hymns to a worship service. Uh, up until that time, it would not be typical for the congregation to join in. And so Charles was introducing a way in which people could not only sing, and of course John talked about uh, Methodism being born in song and to sing lustily, uh, but also a way in which many of those who had responded to the Methodist preaching themselves were unable to read or write or even if they were able to, perhaps could not afford to buy a book. And so people were able to take in the words that Charles had written into their hearts and to learn them. And therefore they were always available to them without the need to read or write or to have hymn books accessible. The Methodists, as they began to be called, continued to draw more people. However, Christ had also told his disciples that they would bear 100-fold with persecutions. John and the Methodists were no exception. On several occasions, paid mobs besieged him. John wrote in his journal about a time when a bull was set loose in a meeting, though it never hurt him, and he went on with the meeting. He also recounts the time that a certain George Clifton, a prize fighter, was sent to cause him harm. The man ended up converting on the spot. Some persecution was physical, and some came in the form of mockery, such as one well-known account. Beau Nash, the reigning dandy of England, was sojourning among the fashionable circles of Bath when it was announced that John Wesley was coming to preach in that place. In a spirit of high jest, Nash boasted among his friends that he would attend the meeting and confound the ridiculous Methodist ranter. After Wesley had begun preaching, the beau entered the meeting pompously, and coming up to Wesley, he exclaimed, I desire to know what these people come here for. One of these people retorted, Sir, let an old woman answer him. You, Mr. Nash, take care of your body. We take care of our souls, and for the food of our souls we have come here. To this, Nash had no reply, and having been made ridiculous, 
he escaped further embarrassment by leaving the meeting in haste, to the amusement of all the people. In 1739, John established his London headquarters by buying a disused gun foundry, and he turned it into a church. They set up living quarters on the second floor, and Susanna Wesley, who was really active in the movement, she lived there until her death in 1742. That same year, John visited Epworth, and after preaching in the morning service, he was, probably not politely, asked not to return to the evening service to preach. Later that day, his friend John Taylor announced that John would be preaching, but he'd be preaching in the churchyard. And that evening he preached, standing on his father's grave. Never one to be refused, he continued to preach there night after night for seven nights. So many people wanted to hear him speak. This is the common room. Uh, it's just above the chapel we've just been in, and these are the living quarters for Wesley and his lay preachers. In fact, John Wesley's bedroom is just through here. Lay preachers would come and they'd stay here in this room. Uh, this is the table they'd eat at together. Wesley wanted a place where he could meet regularly with lay preachers to encourage them. It was often really, really tough conditions they were preaching in as they'd travel all around the country. Uh, it was often very dangerous and he wanted a kind of retreat center really, a place where they could come and just talk to each other, renew their strength, read the Bible, worship together, get recharged, and then get back out on the road where they could preach. As Anglican pulpits were closed to him, John Wesley continued to preach in the open air. It's been estimated to audiences of tens of thousands. Sometimes he'd start preaching at daybreak. Regularly, he'd be preaching three times a day. But his goal was never to set up another church. What he wanted to do was set up small groups of believers, and he encouraged them to meet at hours that did not conflict with the local parish church. Methodism was never set up to be a separate denomination. They weren't, John Charles were not con you know, concerned about becoming a separate church. What they were developing was a methodical way of being an Anglican, really. That's where Methodism comes from, just that word method. And originally it was a term of abuse, a term of ridicule for the Holy Club in Oxford, this small group of rather earnest young students. Holy Club was one term of ridicule, Methodist was another, there were lots of others as well. Um, and it really was, because they were terribly earnest and very different from the people around them, that this, this term came into being. Um, but it is very apt, and really we believe that Methodism came into being actually here in the, in the house in, in the Epworth Rectory, because it was from Susanna's very methodical way of educating her family. Um, that John first had his inspiration to develop this very structured, organised way of approaching life and faith. It's hardly surprising that such a vibrant and expanding movement would be contained in one country alone. While opposition to the Methodists was always present, it was so because people embraced it. It met a present need, and if it did so in England, surely it would do so outside the country. John and Charles Wesley's time in America was not very successful. George Whitfield was much more successful and really that's what began the partnership between America and Britain in terms of the development of Methodism. Um, but in fact, um, the first Methodism overseas from Britain was, was not in America but in Antigua in the Caribbean. Um, Thomas Coke was, was one of the very early Methodist missionaries, a remarkable man and who travelled across the Atlantic on numerous occasions. And on one of his very early trips across, um, there was a storm and his ship um, couldn't land where it was intended to, um, off the Canadian coast, and he ended up being, being blown down to Antigua. And on Christmas Day, he landed in Antigua and found a worshipping Methodist community already existing, um, which had grown up um, because of the, the work of Nathaniel Gilbert, who uh, was a plantation owner, um, who'd been converted by John Wesley at his home in Wandsworth, actually, in South London, and then gone back over and started preaching to his slaves um, on his plantation in Antigua. And from that had grown this grassroots Methodist community. Um, and so that really was the beginnings of overseas Methodist mission. Of course, in America, you have the colonies, and then as they begin to expand westwards, uh, often the field preachers, the lay preachers, the itinerant preachers would follow those communities as they moved westwards. Of course, you also have 
the empire that's beginning to expand here in England, having influences in China and India, and over, of course, to places like South Africa and Australia. Wesley would have a mixture. It would, some would be ordained Anglican ministers, uh, others would be perhaps people who had taken on responsibilities of leadership through the class meetings and had demonstrated themselves to be uh, gifted and so they would then be invited to then go out and to preach in the open air. I think what's clear is Wesley had a very open mind about who was involved with the movement. His main concern revolved around that they should preach the word of God. So not only would he allow non-ordained men to preach, but he would also allow women to preach. And again, that was one of the hallmarks of the early movement, that John allowing women to have positions of responsibility. Again, we might think that that's uh, nothing new today, but in the 18th century, uh, very enlightened thinking. In order to increase his influence, John began to publish his sermons. He wrote 5,000 pamphlets. But because he believed it wasn't good for your health to sit down writing for too long, he had this shelf built into his windowsill. This is his bedroom. And this is the actual shelf that he ordered to be made. So you can imagine him standing here. He was, he was only small, he was five foot three, maybe looking out at the view, and he'd have his pen, which would be a quill pen, and he'd dip it in ink. And this is where he wrote all his pamphlets and his letters. It's kind of amazing to think he actually did it here. It's a wonderful story, but it's not just a historic story. It's about how this story impacts upon people in their lives today. Um, so I think that for me, the legacy is that we have a church today, which I hope is welcoming and accepting of others, uh, whatever their background, whatever their understanding of the Christian faith. John was very clear, there are things that we must believe and we must understand and accept. Uh, but I think that he demonstrated he was willing to share that message with all and that nobody was excluded from the love of God because we are all part of God's creation. John Wesley's legacy, different people would, would um, probably focus on, on different things, um, but I think he had a great combination of, of allowing people to feel the grace of God. First and foremost, there was nothing going to restrict that. Salvation by faith, everybody had access to it, this inclusive love of God. But then there were implications for realising that, that it then had, a, uh, had a, an implication on how you lived out your life, that you should be searching for, for holiness, um, for doing good to other people, for living frugally and well. I think the, the emphasis he put on method and organisation obviously um, underpins the church of today, um, education, uh, but above all that inclusive love of God that he communicated in so many different ways. During his lifetime, John Wesley rode on horseback over 250,000 miles. That's the equivalent of riding a horse around planet Earth 10 times at the equator. He preached over 40,000 sermons, and his brother Charles wrote 6,500 hymns, many of which are still sung in churches all over the world today. They weren't just concerned with people's spiritual needs, with their eternal salvation. They were also concerned with people's immediate practical needs here and now. They didn't just set up churches, they set up schools, orphanages and hospitals. And the impact of these institutions is felt all over the world to this very day. John was rescued from a fire as a child. He literally fell into his father's arms. But it wasn't until he was able to fall into his heavenly father's arms to completely trust in the atonement of Jesus Christ for his sins, that his soul was at peace. It really was as if he was a brand snatched from the fire and set aside for a greater purpose. As he lay on his deathbed, he was thinking about the future and the thing that troubled him the most was the international slave trade, the terrible suffering of slaves all over the world. The very last letter he wrote was to a young man named William Wilberforce and he was urging him to continue his fight to abolish the slave trade. At his death in 1791, aged 88, he had 79,000 followers in England, 
and 40,000 in America. And today, his influence and that of his brother Charles and his mother Susanna continues to change lives. As he lay dying, his last recorded words were, best of all, God is with us.